Well, welcome, welcome everyone to another Kukarankian Lunch and Learn. Um, I am uh, running solo today, and so we're going to have a good old time. So again, I'm I'm Brian Worthen. Um, I'm with Kukarankian in Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about geodesy. <clears throat> so, uh, geodesy, let, let's, let's jump into it. So, geodesy, the, the formal definition from the NGS, well, actually, let me take a second and talk about the NGS. So, uh, this particular science is kind of governed under uh, NOAA, if you're familiar with NOAA, under the NGS, which stands for National Geodetic Survey. Um, so uh, the NGS kind of writes the book on this stuff. And um, I mean, a lot of people are involved, but most of our resources come from, from the NGS. Um, and so I took this definition of geodesy from the NGS, right? So uh, geodesy is the science of accurately measuring and understanding three fundamental properties of the earth. Uh, it's geometric shape, it's orientation in space. Um, I'm getting phone calls, great. It's orientation in space and it's gravity filled as well as changes of these properties with time, right? Uh, so there's a lot there. My definition of geodesy is, uh, it's, it's the science of understanding how to measure the earth. <clears throat> so that's, that's how I see it. Um, why I wanted to cover this topic is really because I see geodesy as a big deal. Uh, impacts everything in, in how we see the world, uh, how we analyze and understand the world. Um, and specifically in, in our field and mapping and all of its related fields, uh, if you don't have an understanding of geodesy, uh, I, I like to say you don't have a foundation for your data. Your, your data stands without any foundation. Um, and, and I've seen firsthand how um, an understanding of geodesy has really impacted major real world projects. Um, so I wanted to give a couple examples out here to just state how big of a deal it is. Uh, and I, so there, I, I won't name names, but there was a, a university locally to me and a geology department who was, they were doing some studies and monitoring some, the, some movement of the earth and some benchmarks. And they came up with this study and this report and they said that the valley was sinking. And it was like, for them, it was like doomsday. They're like, look, we can track the valley is sinking and we've got, we've got earth movement and problems. <clears throat> so they, they made a big deal out of this and published papers. And, and ultimately it climbed and climbed and went, and went to the NGS and uh, some other scientists got involved um, and they made a big deal out of it. And it, when it came back down to it, um, turns out, the these geologists didn't really have a good understanding of how to use their their GPS equipment and how geodesy worked, and they there was no issue at all, right? This big huge thing flopped. <clears throat> so, like I said, you have to have an understanding of geodesy uh, in order to have a foundation of your data. Another example that I saw firsthand. Um, there's a really large industrial project that uh, was local here. And literally this project was hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and the initial mapping and surveying of it was done. And, and we explained that there was, you know, a certain mapping projection and things that we'll talk about later that needed to be factored into the design of this. And it never was. And we were always, you know, the, the people I was involved with were always trying to raise a red flag. Well, it caused design problems and delays to the tune that over the course of a couple of years, uh, they went so far out of budget that they scrapped a project that was hundreds of millions of dollars, literally, because their bad understanding of geodesy. So that's why I want to make a big deal out of it. And then 
on my end as a vendor, uh, it's my goal to help everyone be successful. And I see a lot of different people in a lot of different industries. And I see a lot of need for just some basic understanding of, of geodesy. So today, um, this is a huge topic, right? And I just want to, um, you know, disc here's my disclosure that we're only going to talk about basics. And if anything, you know, we're going to talk about basics and spark some interest so that people, you know, further grow in their understanding of jobs. So let's jump into it. Uh, <clears throat> here's a rhetorical question. What is the shape of the earth? It's flat, of course, right? No. Okay. No, it's not flat. The earth isn't flat. Let's get that out there. So you might say the earth is round. Yeah. You might say the earth is a sphere, right? I think we're getting closer and closer. My, some people might say an elliptical spheroid, right? And then the, uh, the most accurate in my eyes would be those of you who said that it's an ever-changing smashed meatball, okay? That's how I see the shape of the earth. Mathematically, we're going to talk a lot about how we mathematically model the earth, okay? Mathematically, we're going to model the earth as an elliptical spheroid, which is what this image illustrates. Now, here's the smashed meatball. Um, the smashed meatball is what we're up against, right? It's an ever-changing, evolving smashed meatball that we have to work with. But the instruments and the things we use to map the Earth, um, they don't understand smashed meatball. They understand elliptical spheroid. So then we have uh, this, this math problem, or the, we create a new problem of measuring the Earth. Um, so getting in, you know, to get into it, a lot of people are familiar with latitude, longitude, height. Um, and we think of latitude, longitude, and height based on the center of the earth, right? We'd call that geocentric. Well, I made a quick little video. There we go. This is just Google Earth. So if you look at the per parallel lines on here that run horizontally, we're going to call that latitude. Right, they're angles of measurement from the based on the center of the earth, so to speak. The lines that intersect at the north and south poles that run vertically, those are longitude. If anyone ever wants to read a cool book, read a book called Longitude. It's a history of how we figured out how to what longitude meant. So that's what those lines are. And those are all based on angles um, to the center of the earth, so to speak. Then the next step in creating our model. Um, we have, oh, great. Now I'm, the terminology is slipping my mind. Um, the, we have the major, <laughs> major minor access. There we go. Okay. Oh, so back to it. So when I was drawing these radius points, Come on now. Why isn't it letting me hit play? Okay, well, I'm going to skip that part. So we also, in creating that elliptical spheroid, we have a major and minor axes, like radius points, to create that mathematical model. Um, and major being in the longitudinal direction and minor is the latitudinal direction. And then we have a, a flattening value and an eccentricity value. Those are all stuff that we really don't have to dive in too deep on, but these are the factors that make up the ellipsoid for the earth. Um, <clears throat> and, and then there's, there's a geocentric based model and a geodetic based, based model. Really, because the earth isn't a perfect sphere, we have to have, it, it can't be geocentric, right? Uh, some old GIS systems were always geocentric based and they can't ever be as accurate because we don't actually have a center of the earth. Uh, geodetic means measuring this latitude and longitude relative to perpendicular at the earth's surface, right? 
Um, and so that's so we always are looking at a geodetic model of the Earth. And then throughout time, we've had different ways and different measurements to compute that ellipsoid or mathematical model. So we have all those parts of the mathematical model, um, and we had different ways of getting there. So if you look on the map in this image, it's a triangulation map. So if we think back to the day uh, before we had GPS, we were using astronomic observations. So you'd set up an instrument and you'd sight Polaris or you'd sight, you know, uh, some astronomical feature to, to get a bearing. And then we would also measure other bearings to other points. And as, as surveyors and geographers mapped out the Earth, they, they've, they created their different models of the Earth. Um, and I also have this picture down on the bottom right. So this is near my house. Is, uh, we call it the shack on Mount Timpanogos. Well, the shack on Mount Timpanogos, most people don't realize that, that is an, a survey monument. This is pretty common in the West that on top of peaks will have survey monuments that surveyors would use to triangulate against. And they built this understanding of the shape of the earth. And when they did this, they built this understanding of the, the ellipsoid and, and the map of the earth. Um, then they started, they had different points of reference that, that they would go back to. Right? Um, that's, I'm call, that's what we call reference frame. So um, historically, we used the, the different ref, reference frames and datums. Again, just points of reference of how we're creating this model and where we're starting from. So we have the NAD 27 datum. This is a North American datum in 1927, which used a mathematical model called the Clark 1866 mathematical model. Those models go back to the major minor axis, you know, the things that I described before. And Clark 1866, they were using that mathematical model since Lewis and Clark. That's literally what it was from. Later on in the 80s, we developed the North American datum of 1983 and the North and then the NAVD, that stands for North American Vertical Datum, 1988. And all of a sudden we had a new ellipsoid model. We have the GRS 80, right? Different set of mathematical parameters to create this model of the Earth. And then it's really a really common one that a lot of us are familiar with is this other one called the WGS-84, right? WGS-84, you know, also uses its own mathematical parameters and its own ellipsoid for the earth. And it's different from, from NAD-83. <clears throat> and then we have ITRF, the international ellipsoid. Um, but I, I want to touch on WGS-84. That's important because we have to understand anyone that's using GNSS or GPS, I interchange GPS with GNSS, even though G GPS is in proper terminology, we really want to say um, GNSS, right? Uh, Global Navigation Satellite System. Um, anyway, point is GNSS always starts out measuring WGS84. That's the only thing that GPS or GNSS understands is WGS84. Everything after that is essentially a mathematical conversion, right? So that's how it starts out. So GPS understands WGS84 and measures it. We have all these mathematical parameters to create this, this spheroid, right? This elliptical spheroid of the earth. Um, and then that takes us to our next step, okay? That is a map projection. So again, even though the earth is not flat, we treat it that way, right? It's confusing. Um, but because of the nature of maps and mapping and construction, we treat everything flat. We build buildings as if they are flat, right? So the way I like to think of this is to um, is an origami problem. So if you had a globe and a, you had a map, and I was actually going to film my kids doing this over the weekend, I never got to it, but and you had a map and you tried to place the map on the globe and wrap it around, 
you could not do it without creating a bunch of folds and, and wrinkles in that map. Well, that is the next challenge that we try and solve with a map projection. A map projection is basically, what do we do to handle the air or the folds and wrinkles in the map to get it to meet this model of the Earth? Uh, the Tahiti example. My wife was in Tahiti in high school, um, and Tahiti is a French country. So whenever they viewed maps, they would either have a map of France or a map of Tahiti. And France was... It was a French map. It was, in, it was the center of the earth was France, and uh, France was bigger than all the other countries around it. Same thing with Tahiti. Tahiti would be in the center of the map, and it was bigger than everything else around it, even though it was a teeny tiny little island. Well, I don't believe that's because they were being misleading, even though it's funny to think that. The truth is that's a map projection that is going to work best for their geographic area. Right. Some map projections are better at uh, having accurate area. Some map projections are better at having accurate um, perimeters. Some are better at making the area look more accurate. Right. Um, <clears throat> that's what handling the wrinkles is. Um, and we have the NGS in the U.S. We have what we call state plane coordinate systems. These are predefined map projections that the NGS has developed, and they're going to be the, the most common ones. I'm going to pull it up here. We have the Lambert formal conic and the transverse Mercator. So this is an, these images represent how they essentially take a flat piece of paper and turn it into a map, right, to model the Earth. Well, <clears throat> um, they all have their own op issues and you would use a different projection for a different area based on shape. Uh, for example, if you think of north, you look at how the, the paper is wrapped around the, the globe here, right? Well, in any kind of projection, if you're in the center, then straight up to north is going to be pretty accurate, a pretty accurate representation of north. But the further you go east or the further you go west, you are actually going to exaggerate and warp what north is. So there's more than one kind of north. It's an ever-changing thing. Even though we think of true north as true north, well, it depends on the map projection, right? Um, so there's different ways of handling this error. So in general, in the mapping world, the smaller the area and the smaller the map projection, the, or the map, the less error there is in that projection. Right, so it's pretty typical for a surveyor uh, to go out and define a really small area to create this map so they don't have run into more air. So to take a step back, you know, we started out, say we're, we're measuring with a GPS. We, the GPS reads WGS84, it understands it's ellipsoid, and it uh, takes into account a map projection. Um, so it's converting, latitude and longitude to a map projection. And then once it has a map projection, now you have an X and a Y value or a northing and an easting value. So we moved on to the next step. And then we go into the next mathematical problem, right, to address. And that is ground distances versus grid distances. And they are different. So my example for explaining this is goes back to uh, the early early American history when we were building all these steel erected skyscrapers. Well, it was common practice to use a plumb bob, you know, the the plumb bob that you know Cooker Rankin's beginnings, you know, manufacturing plumb bobs and hand levels that you you know the weight on the string. And if you look at this this illustration in the background. And you can envision a, a skyscraper going up in the sky and you're hanging plumb bobs in order to figure out the steel. Um, and those plumb bobs are going to be pulled to the center of the earth, center of the earth, right? Well, these early skyscrapers would actually be wider at the top than they were at the bottom because of this, right? Well, in mapping, we run into that same problem. If you were surveying, 
with a GPS and you have, you've entered in a state plane coordinate system and you measure um, two points on the earth, right? And then you pull a tape measure between those two points on the earth. And if you don't account for it, the tape measure distance will be different from your, from the distance measured with the GPS points because of this scale factor, right? Um, here's an example of what we call it a survey tie sheet, right? So on here, you know, it, it references an area's uh, map factor and combined scale factor. Um, another example here, uh, this is um, a retracement survey and, and uh, they're explaining how, how their dimensions are. So it shows that the dimensions outside of parentheses are the ground distance. Inside of parentheses, they're the grid distance. And you'll notice in half a mile, uh, that's, you know, like seven, basically seven tenths or so, right? Eight tenths um, of a foot comparing the two distances. Well, if you were using a coordinate system, instead the measurement, so if you were looking at the northings and eastings versus the distances, instead of the distances, and you were looking at ground versus grid in my area, you know, if you if everything is scaled from zero, that's about 40 feet different, right? So if you don't get that right, it, it, it can really mess things up. Um, so that's why we use what we call a combined scale factor, right? And this image kind of explains it all, right? So if you have your map projection and you're comparing it against the ellipsoid that we talked about, that mathematical ellipsoid, and then the distance to you at ground, right? Well, then you have this elevation value factor that you times the scale factor, and that would equal your combined factor. And you'd have to compute that in, in your projection in order to have an accurate ground distance. So that's the next step. And then once we have this, you know, we start out with latitudes, longitudes, now we have, you know, northings and eastings, we co compensated everything so it's scaled the ground. Then we got to talk about height, right? Now height is uh, how do we get our vertical, right? Sometimes people will, will ask, why do surveyors have more than one elevation for the same point, right? Well, it's kind of complicated. Right. You would think everything would be based off of sea level. Well, it kind of is, but it's kind of not. So the way it works is at um, at sea level, we can measure the height once every 25 years. Tangent. Right? You can determine the average mean sea level. Um, but inland, we don't necessarily have the sea level to figure out height. So we have to use what's called a geoid model. Geoid model is another mathematical model that essentially um, it's the, the theoretical model of where the ocean would be, but it's not a perfect thing because it's based on gravity. So it's, it's computed with gravity. So um, our, again, our GPS is understanding this ellipsoid. When we have the ellipsoidal height, so if you're measuring a point, and if you look at the, the image on the screen, if you're measuring a point, the top of the mountain, the distance between that point and the ellipsoid model in your GPS system is an ellipsoidal height. Then you have to use the geoid or geoidal separation to figure out what that height would be in theory above sea level. And we use this equation, right? Orthometric height is... Uh, the height minus the geoid, and the geoid is typically a negative number. So that's how you compute height or estimated height above sea level. Um, and then lastly, we're always subject to local points. So sometimes there's a local height. So in that, in that case, we throw all this out the window and we go to something like an NGS benchmark or some other vertical datum that's a local height. And and elevation is determined, you know, plus or minus above this point, right? So it can be confusing because we have different points of reference to determine height. But 
all these things add up to determine our position and how we can measure the earth. Um, that's the summary of it, of, how, of the understanding of how it all comes together. And then we have to make decisions, right? What are we going to do? You know, how are we setting up this map? Um, so if you're creating a new project, there's, you know, you should ask yourself, you know, does this map have to be GIS mapping grade or does it, is it going to be used for design? Does it have to be more accurate than that? Um, are we going to use a state plane coordinate system? Are we going to use universal transverse Mercator? Most GIS defaults to universal transverse Mercator, but again, those are huge zones. So they tend to have more air. So you might want to use a state plane or a modified or local coordinate system. Um, and then you have to determine, is this going to be used for surveying, like a boundary survey? If that's the case, more than likely, it probably needs to be scaled to ground. And you have to decide, how are you going to scale it to ground? Um, also, are you going to tie it to local monuments or benchmarks? Uh, what's the shape of the project? If, if you're going to if you have a corridor that's long and skinny, you're probably going to use a Lambert conformal map projection versus a transverse Mercator projection because of the way it handles the air. Um, and it, are you going to match somebody else's coordinate system? So these are all questions that you have to have an understanding of geodesy to know how you're going to make these decisions so that you can answer to those decisions and so that you have good data. Um, I was going to put a little burp in about uh, what the NGS is doing with uh, their 2022 GRAV-D project. Uh, I probably don't have time for that, but I will say, you know, that we're always improving. Our understanding of geodesy is always changing and we're always improving. Uh, we're in a position where we're going to go from three zones in Utah. Again, I'm just referencing Utah. We're going to go from three zones to like something like 20 zones, right? Um, and it's going to be a good thing, but it, you know, it's all, it's all, how are we going to handle certain mapping situations? So, um, and that's it. That's what I had for, uh, basics, uh, understanding geodesy. So, um, at this point, let's see where we at. We got three minutes, I guess, for questions. Um, let me see if I can open up our chat here. Well, again, thanks everybody. Uh, hopefully that uh, was somewhat informative and spiked some interest. Um, and again, reach out to us and anytime at Cooper Rankin and we'll see you know, what we can do to help improve your guys' uh, understanding of geodesy. Uh, we have road shows coming up, um, demos coming up. So uh, pay attention to us on social media and, and email and stay in touch. And, and hopefully we'll be in touch. So thanks again. See you.